This presentation is an analysis of John Keats's poems, Ode to a Nightingale and Ode on Melancholy. Analysis of Ode to a Nightingale. Because this is a long poem, I will not read it, but will discuss it. This poem was written one morning in the spring of 1819 when Keats took a chair outside to sit under a plum tree to listen to the song of a nightingale that had made a nest outside the home where he was staying in Hampstead, England. He wrote the poem in two or three hours on some scraps of paper he brought with him. In the first stanza, the speaker says he feels as though he has drunk hemlock tea, making him drowsy and forgetful as he listens to the nightingale song. He calls the nightingale a dryad of the trees, or wood nymph, or an immortal not of this earth. He wants to go to sleep and forget his troubles on earth. In the second stanza, he speculates that if he drinks alcohol, perhaps he can imagine he is one with the nightingale and thus experience immortality. He writes that I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee, the nightingale, fade away into the forest dim. In the third stanza, he becomes sad as he is remembered, reminded of the mortality and sadness found on earth. Many people he knew personally died at a young age from tuberculosis. He discusses his desire to forget sadness and escape when he writes, Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget the weariness, the fever, and the fret. In the fourth stanza, he describes his desire to escape worldly sadness and fly off with the nightingale through his imagination, such as through his poetry when he writes, Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus, which is the god of wine, and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy or poetry. In the fifth stanza, he speculates that perhaps through imagination and poetry, he can experience immortality and become one with the bird. He imagines he is dead and cannot see but can feel, smell, and hear when he says, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, but in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows. He said he wishes he could die and become immortal as he listens to the bird's beautiful song. In the sixth stanza, he says that he has been half in love with easeful death, which almost seems to seduce him. In the seventh stanza, he proclaims that the nightingale and its song is immortal and has been heard throughout history when he says, Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. In the final stanza, the word forlorn brings him back to reality. He asks, Do I wake or sleep? And was it a vision or a wakeful dream? He mourns the loss of his ability to connect with the nightingale, admitting fancy cannot chat so well, and he bids adieu adieu to the nightingale and his wish to become one with it. This poem is typically romantic in its elevation of nature and intense emotion. Ode on Melancholy No, no, go not to leave, neither twist wolf's bane tight-rooted for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by night my nightshade, ruby grape of per proserpine. Make not your rosary of yew berries, nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's miseries. For shade to shade will come too, too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. But when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from the heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an April shroud, then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave, or on the wreath of globed peonies, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand, and let her rave, and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy, whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, and aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison, 
while the bee mouth sips. I, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine, his soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung. Analysis of Ode on Melancholy This poem is made up of three stanzas. In the first stanza, Keats makes several allusions or references to Greek mythology in order to suggest that the way to deal with melancholy or sadness is not by committing suicide. He makes an allusion to Persephone, whom he calls Proserpine, who is the wife of Hades, god of the underworld in Greek mythology. Persephone wanted to kill herself. He also mentions Leith, the river of Hades that causes forgetfulness, and tells the reader, no, no, go not to Leith, or twist wolf's, wolf's bane, which is a poisonous root people eat to kill themselves. Another allusion he makes is to beetles, which are an Egyptian symbol of death, and yew berries, which are also a symbol of death. He tells the reader, make not your rosary of yew berries. He tells the reader to, be, to not be obsessed with death when one feels melancholy. In stanza two, Keats reads, tells the reader he or she should look at the beauty in nature or in his lover's or her lover's eyes when he or she feels melancholy. He tells the reader to gut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of globed peonies all images of beauty in nature. He tells the reader, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. In the third stanza, he says that melancholy and beauty are inextricably linked. In the third stanza, he personifies melancholy, calling it by the female pronoun she in the line she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. This stanza is filled with images of the mixture of sadness and beauty or pleasure and pain. In the last line, he makes an allusion to the Greek and Roman practice of hanging trophies in the temples of the gods. He suggests that people can be in heaven with the goddess melancholy if we are willing to feel both pleasure and pain together. Thus Keats promotes his belief that one cannot feel the deepest pleasure without experiencing the deepest pain, as he felt the two were inextricably linked. Therefore, he in a sense tells the reader to celebrate pain as it can be used to experience the deepest pleasures in life.